All right. Hey, if you're new here, uh, welcome to Everyday Torah. Uh, we're doing a lot of different stuff on the channel. Uh, number one is if you haven't uh, taken a look at the uh, Roman series I'm doing. And, you know, for me, I want to do everything in plain language. If you're just brand new to the Bible and you don't understand the Torah, uh, you know, that's my gig. That's what I do. So you can check out the link up here. And another thing that I'm doing is uh, I've got some people in my life that also are seeking to follow Jesus with everything that they are. And they're really smart people. And I want to begin dialoguing uh, with these people uh, about their journey. And one of the things that, uh, this is Jacob, by the way. Jacob, say hi. Hello. Hey, this is Jacob. Uh, Jacob is a really bright guy. And one of the things that we want to do as dialogue partners is uh, take you through uh, Passover biblically, going to first fruits biblically. Uh, that season is getting pretty close for us, and uh, uh, we want to have some in depth conversations that aren't really good for YouTube uh, videos, but you know, just a, just something you could listen to in your car and have a good time with that. So, anyway, this is Jacob Kelsch. Um, Jacob, uh, so I'm I am in uh, uh, Northern California, Sacramento area, and you are too. Yeah, where are you from? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm I'm from uh, Orangevale in the uh, originally, so just on the outskirts of Sacramento. Gotcha. Okay, and so can you t t just tell everyone uh, where did we meet and uh, what was that like? It was life changing, Trevor. Uh, <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> well, what? Well, That's funny. No, it was a uh, it was seminary uh, a seminary I attended, and you were one of my uh, first professors in the first semester they attended the seminary. Yeah, okay. And then, uh, so, are you graduated? I am. I am, yeah. I graduated, gosh, I feel like my memory is slipping. I probably need more coffee. Uh, 2019. Yeah, that sounds right. That sounds right. Okay. 2019 is when I graduated. <laughs> and then uh, your degree is in what? Uh, well, it's... Uh, yeah, we got an MDiv. The uh, focus was uh, pastoral um, aspect of of the MDiv and okay. theology. So, same thing with my undergrad was pastoral ministry and, and theology. Right. So you know, obviously, we are here because um, you're a follower of Jesus, and you uh, started understanding uh, that a big part of following Jesus is to uh, take seriously. Torah, the instruction of God uh, for our Christian life. And, yeah. you know, I think a, what a lot of people would want to hear is, how did you, I mean, you know, here you have me in a class. I'm your professor at the time, right? How did that yeah. feel when I first started talking about it? Um, what kinds of things did, were you like, was there a plus side? Was there like a, did all these red flags go up in your head? What was happening? Well, you know, it wasn't... Um I wouldn't say red flags so much as you you brought up points that were already questions in my head in a large degree. I don't know if you remember, but one of the first class sessions, I can't remember if it was the first or um, second or third, whatnot, it's pretty soon. And it started with a question that you'd ask was who, who decides what good and evil is uh, who decides what right and wrong is and so on the surface the the question was it was not a trick question right it was it was kind of a funny situation though because you had this whole classroom of you know six to eight seminarians and nobody answered it was like we all thought it was a, like a trick question or something like that and for me, I knew the question was rhetorical because I knew I felt like you knew the answer. But for me, it was getting at something else that I had been really struggling with. I know that sounds crazy as a, a believer, but it was this internal question of who who really gets to decide this, and it addressed a fundamental struggle. I use the word struggle, but maybe struggle is the right word. I had been trying to work through for years. It, you know, I had been a part of a couple of denominations growing up. And I was turning 30 that year. 
And something that always bugged me was why there was so much disagreement between denominations. That that why why are denominations a thing? That was something that had bugged me probably since I was 15, 16 years old, right? And if there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, as Paul says there is in Ephesians 4, 5 to 6, why are there thousands of denominations? Now, you could argue how many denominations there are. You could say, well, those are just technically this denomination. But the point is, why is there so many? It it didn't make any sense to me. Mm-hmm. And so when you asked who gets to decide what's right and wrong, the reality was I I'm not the smartest guy, but when you look at it, it's like, I I know that two competing truth claims is not possible. You you can't have two people discussing the same topic and have them have uh, two completely different claims to truth, which would render them exclusive. They, they can't both be right. And so that was one of the things that bugged me. And is, so my question was, where did that leave me? And it had been this building thing for for years. Like I said, it started when I was 15, 16. And where did it leave me? First of all, because it's always the introspective. It's always asking myself the question, where, did it, where does this leave me with this problem? How do I reconcile this problem? And uh, secondary where did it leave those claiming to follow Messiah? And I was in this crisis of faith crisis, but I was in this crisis of faith where my conclusion at the time was that it was really willy nilly. It basically came down to each individual person, a believer, I should say in this context, deciding what they thought was right, tossing in their lot with that particular denomination but to and their it, to their credit, wouldn't you say that, you know, I just want to say, you know, m- most evangelical people I know are are people who are seeking to follow Jesus with everything that they are. And maybe they yeah. would. And, and by the way, I, it should be um, I should point out that when I ask that particular question, I am actually not doing a gotcha question. I'm trying to get people to draw the circle around uh, the uh whatever might inform them of what is good and evil, whether that be by the spirit, was it something they read in the gospels? Do they just see it in Jesus? Do they, uh, are they learning it from Paul? I'm trying to get, I'm, I'm trying to force that issue theologically because I think the willy nilly part is important because here's what we know. We know that uh, when Yeshua said, uh, teach them to obey all I've commanded you, uh, we know that people do take that seriously. And so yeah, absolutely. Uh, where are these commandments coming from? Are they coming from uh, the Sermon on the Mount? Is it how Jesus acted toward the leper? Do we include right. Paul's, um, do we include Paul's uh, uh, rehash of that, however he might unpack that? And, th- and yeah. they would say yes, um, but I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to for, uh, force seminary students to think about that question. Well, it, it's a really important question because how you frame that, how you draw that circle is going to inform every single decision you make. It's foundational. Who decides what is right and wrong, good and evil? And if you if you have the circle, it it allows the individual to make sense of reality. So every single thing that they think is inside the circle is good. Well, they're going to stay inside the circle, and they're not going to touch the stuff where they, at least they shouldn't touch, right? According to their own conscience, what's outside the circle. So it's really important, and that's why it it um, just had this thing that happened with me. Because I don't know if you remember the the response I gave, but I was kind of looking at everybody. What did what <laughs> what do we say? And after a big few moments, it became clear that nobody's going to else. Because you know, they're just—I don't know if it's the first day or people just were kind of. What's? Well, why was he asking that question? So I opted to be that guy, as you know, I I can be that guy, and just answer the question as best I could. And you were facing the whiteboard, and you were ready to write stuff down, and I just blurted out, well, "God does." You know, God's the one that decides what's right and wrong. I don't know if you remember that. 
Well, faintly, but uh, how did I respond? Do you remember? You, yeah, no, I, I do. It was kind of funny because um, it, it was, you had this look of, did he really just say that? Like you, you had the pen up at the whiteboard and you just turned around and you just looked at me. And you had this, like in this slow mo, did he just say that? And then you kind of dropped the marker and said, I love you so much. <laughs> oh. oh, that's good. <laughs> it was, it was, it was a very memorable moment for me because it was, it was like, is it that simple? Is it really that simple that God decides what is right and wrong? And going to your point about people trying to navigate according to their own individual you know, denominational background or how they were raised. Cause we all, ha we all bring baggage to the table. People are raised in a certain way to think a certain way. And like you said, most people, and I, I would say Christianity, cause it, how exceedingly broad it's become. Most of those people in some way, shape or form, I think want to follow Jesus, Yeshua, but they're doing it the way they've been taught in, in most cases. And I had been taught according to several different denominational doctrines. And like I was saying earlier, what it, it seemed to me, my opinion, it came down to, I believe this. So whatever doctrine this is, other people like me believe this. So I'm going to be with the group that believes the way I do. And that's just normal human behavior. I don't think that there's anything earth-shattering about that. But the problem was the question you asked doesn't just throw a wrench into the machine for me personally at that point. It's like you might as well point at a battleship cannon at a Lego set and just like pull the trigger, you know, because for, for believers to comfortably reach the decision of what denomination to be a part of, they're... They're putting themselves in a position that I think is dangerous because I, I did it myself. All, all, I was putting myself in a position that I think was dangerous because I was making the call what I thought was right in my own eyes, what I thought was wrong in my own eyes, and then I was walking in it. So for me personally, the question you asked caused me to realize as I'm walking the way I'm currently doing it, I'm the arbiter of right and wrong. Okay. So if I might push back a little bit, isn't every seminarian in that classroom thinking, of course, God decides good and evil, but the, um, uh, the uh, markers changed with Jesus? I think that's probably a fair assessment, and I think that's probably why nobody answered the question, because, you know, there's a, several other uh, people in that classroom that, I can think of one gentleman in particular, and he's smarter than me, way smarter than me, he's absolutely brilliant, and he didn't answer, and it was almost like when I looked around, they didn't answer, it was... Yeah, it was just this, did he really just ask that? Like, duh, you know, of course God. But it's it's different to know it. And this is where I found a lot of theology, and we'll get into this, I'm sure, in the, in the future. Sure. It's where a lot of theology is good in your head until you vocalize it. Because I find when you actually vocalize what you believe, it, it has, it, 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 there's certain ideas that don't pass muster. And there are certain ideas that you can tell people th hold these things in their mind, but when they actually say them, there's this aspect of something that becomes a functional reality of, oh, that's, that's what I believe. And I would hope that most people realize what I believe impacts how I live, how I walk, how I follow the Lord. So I think that there's this gap, at least in Christianity right now, where we've got head knowledge. People people know the basics, and that's good. But it's it's like the 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 actions. It's like the hands aren't communicating with the heart at times. But and it's not because the hands don't necessarily want to do what the heart wants to do. The hands do exactly what the heart wants to do. But 
I think a lot of people don't understand how impacted their hands are by their heart in Christianity it is the, I guess, the most basic way I can put it. So to go back to your question, isn't it kind of a, well, duh, don't, wouldn't all seminarians? Y- yes, but what I don't say irked, but what kind of surprised me was that if it's that simple and they all knew that, why was there just a looming silence in that classroom for like 30 seconds? Because if they were, if we all knew that and it's that easy of a question, which it is in hindsight, why didn't somebody else blurt it out? Why did it take me? Not that I'm not special. Why did it take me 30 seconds to give an answer to something that, it, I agree with you. It should be blatantly obvious. Well, I mean, to their credit, I mean, you're in a you're in a classroom situation, and you're not really sure if the professor's trying to get you or something like that. Uh, but you know, True. I you know, so if I were to, um, okay, so I'm just kind of thinking through the things that you've said so far. Yeah, um, the whole denomination thing. I mean, we know why those exist. There are theological preferences. Or, right. or it's not a preference. In their in uh, denominational mindsets, it would be that uh, this is the truth, and we're like minded people, so we gather around particular doctrinal truths. And I, right. I can even appreciate that. that. That's fine. But I'm still with you in that. Um, it doesn't seem to me that Jesus uh, was a a, a great uh, proliferator of denominations. <laughs> okay, so that wasn't no. part of the gig, <laughs> no, no doubt. Uh, okay, so now. I know that uh, you were thinking the same thing as uh, those seminary students in that, of course, God decides what is good and evil. But at some point, uh, you were forced to uh, draw your circle around the entire Bible where you included the Torah in that. Uh, yeah. how, how would you describe that process for you? What were some of the initial hiccups? Um, uh, you know, just oh. however you want to reflect on that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so the the journey, I would say, was certainly before you asked the question because it, it piggybacks off of the question of what is holiness. And we'll get to that at some point, I'm sure. But the, the way that I began to draw my circle was that I just... I just went back to Genesis because I, I was well brought up in the scriptures. Um, my mother, my grandmother really made it a point that I always had a, a Bible. They made it a point. My, my mother raised me on animated stories from the Bible. So I was taken through in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, short videos, the stories from the Bible. And so it, it just was one of those things where you kind of have these flashbacks and you start thinking back and you go, okay, well, I know the scriptures, so I'm just going to go ahead and start at the beginning is is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to start from the beginning. I'm just going to go back to Genesis and just read as best as I can yeah. with without trying to load bias. Just let the, 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 the narrator tell me, or let the storyteller, the one who wrote it, tell me what's going on instead of me in, imposing upon it my own hermeneutic mm-hmm. or my own uh, prejudice. And it, it caused a short circuit when I was driving the circle because I, I read the opening chapters and I see, okay, well, how do I decide right and wrong? Oh, so you Don't. say you're, you started reading in Genesis with that question in mind. How you yeah. started, right? Because I mean, honestly, yeah. don't you think that um, anyone uh, who uh, doesn't think like we do uh, would get the impression that uh, the Torah is for them until Jesus arrives, and it's not until you start reading the New Testament that maybe your thinking would change on that? I mean, wouldn't you have to read pretty far along in the Bible to draw any other conclusion? Yeah, and that's a that's a fair way that some people would think that. And I know that because I thought that okay. for a while. And the problem was that the, the Bible doesn't, doesn't lend itself to that. And the way, reason I say that is that the, the Bible is 
comprised of several types of, of literature. It's comprised of narrative. It's comprised of poetry. It's comprised of the prophetic. But what it does, each of those things are true. They are they comprise part of the Bible, but they all tell a singular story. And what was bugging me was that you don't read the Lord of the Rings by starting in book five, because it was originally six books. You don't start the the Lord of the Rings by just dropping into the Return of the King. That's the best way I can describe what the habit is right was the habit for me mm. and why people I can totally see would just jump into you know let's just flip to Matthew you and it's just it's not the way storytelling works and it's not that you would necessarily come away with uh, extremely wrong conclusions but you don't know what's going on you don't know why Frodo's on his way to Mordor you have no clue uh, up and until the point that this uh, discussion of the ring comes up, but how did he get the ring? Why why is this thing so important? Where did Aragorn get this sword? Why is there this awkward tension between Gimli and Legolas? Why? And so there's these unanswered questions that are really important to the narrative. And uh, you, I could use any other story, so I won't go on at nauseum or at length about that. But that was my thing was like, okay, this tells a story. So I, I go back to Genesis and I think, okay, first instance of knowing what's good and evil. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't do it. When you do it, the day that you eat of it, you'll die. So it pretty clear from the narrative i say pretty clear but it would seem that i'll articulate it that way mm -hmm. it would it would appear that eating tree of knowledge of good and evil bad not eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and eating from the tree of life good why because god said one is okay to eat from and god said the other one is not okay to eat from so what happens next? Well, Eve decides the fruit was good from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She decides it's good for food. It was delightful to her eyes. And it would make her wise. That was her estimation of the fruit. Right. That was her opinion. So she ate and she gave to Adam, who was right there with her. And they do this thing. But it was evil in the sight of God. And the question is, why? And for me, I'm looking at this going, well, it's not necessarily that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a bad thing. That the tree in it of itself isn't a problem. What God focuses on, did you eat from the tree I told you not to? The problem is obedience or lack thereof, disobedience. They did what was good in their sight when the line had clearly been drawn, it's not good to eat that. And it's this irony because the word that's used in the Hebrew, tov, gets used over and over and over in the opening salvo of Genesis. It was good. It was good. It was good. And then you get to the end, and God saw that all that he had made, and it was very good. Well, according to who? According to God. God's the one that's making the litmus test because it's good in his eyes. There's no way that, you know, a reptile or a moose or even Adam and Eve could have a concept of what was good. They're just traipsing around this new right. place, just come into existence. I mean, there's kind of, okay, well, this is, what's going on? Like, <laughs> This is, and, and how do you describe the indescribable for them? I mean, they just come to be. They, they have no concept of what good is, but the Lord does. Yeah, they had, to, his... they had to, it seems to me that they allowed Yahweh to uh, determine what was good, and they accepted that uh, right. because it was good. Right. It was very good. Yeah, for sure. Okay. It was very good. And so the the thing that I started noticing here was like, okay. And this is what I teach my son now in hindsight is I always ask him the question, 
who decides what's good and evil or right and wrong? And his response is, God does. And then my response is, okay, what happens when humans decide what is good and evil or right and wrong? And his response is, everything gets screwed up. <laughs> so then, okay, so is there anything post um, uh, Garden of Eden narrative? Okay, so obviously what happened is, uh, they chose that they wanted to take uh, the um, uh, the decision making of what was good and evil into their own hands, exactly. and that was the besetting issue. Uh, they yes. wanted to be in 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 that way. They wanted to be a god themselves. They they wanted to have that control, and they took it, yep. and then they're banished out of the Garden of Eden uh, because uh, they you can't have life that way. Now that right. said. Uh, before we go into the New Testament, was there anything? I, I know there is, but if you, if maybe you could summarize, I don't know. Is there anything post uh, Genesis, um, uh, Garden of Eden narrative that uh, initially set you on this path? Yeah, absolutely. What Moses says, Moshe says to Israel in Deuteronomy twelve eight, you shall not do all what we are doing here today each man doing what is ever right in his own eyes. Okay. So that that's a huge verse. And then fast forward right after you go Deuteronomy, Joshua, and then you dump into Judges. Uh, you read Judges, and the key verse that is serves as the linchpin for the whole narrative of the book of Judges is in jo Judges 17.6 and Judges 21.25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And what's interesting is that prefacing that in Joshua, Joshua's closing statement is, choose this day whom you're going to serve. If it's right in your own eyes to serve the gods of the nations, do that. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I just, you see the snowball going through judges of what happens when you don't, when you start doing what's right in your own eyes, it's an Eden repeat. And then it just continues to not go well. And if you get to, uh, for the sake of the, this discussion, is uh, Exodus 15, 26. If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, your healer. So that one right there is just, whoa. You had this set up in Genesis you get to Exodus, it builds to Deuteronomy, and you see what happens the moment the people start doing what's right in their own eyes. It just goes into chaos in, in Judges. So I would say that that was the, it's the snowball, and it's, it's not that, I think that anybody reading it can see, yeah, this is bad. But again, it's that moment where you have this thing where you, I know that this is wrong. But when you functionally start realizing, oh my gosh, this is what happens when you don't actually do things according to what the Lord says is good and avoid that which he says is evil, it just snowballs. And so I'm going, oh my gosh, it's right here in front of you the whole time. So on this, I would say uh, you've uh, nicely summarized uh, the uh, trajectory of the narrative when it comes to uh, a group of uh, people that were descendants of, of Jacob. These are Israelites. They're trying to get to know this God and this uh, fundamental uh, idea that uh, Yahweh is uh, introducing uh, himself into the lives of these people in a big way. They're no longer serving the gods of Egypt. They're out in this uh, uh, desert situation, and Yahweh has told them, hey, this is how you interact with this holy God. And Joshua, just as you've said, is saying, no, um, we're going to do it. I, My family, we're going to do it in the way that God told us to do it. 
And, you know, if you don't feel that way, all right, go do your thing. But I'm drawing the line in the sand. And then, of course, Israel as a whole doesn't do it well. The prophets come against this. But all right, great. I think any any person that is uh, an upstanding seminary evangelical student is going to go, I'm dialed in. So far, so good. But now we have Jesus. Yeah. What are you gonna what are you gonna do with Jesus? I mean, he, he says on the cross, it is finished. Now, I know what he's talking about there. <laughs> he's not finishing yeah. the, the the Torah, the law, but I mean, doesn't it seem to, how you know, I'm talking to you as a seminary student now. How are you dealing yeah. with Paul, holiness? Uh, what are you doing in the New Testament? Uh, oh, man. So the going back to your question, at one of your earlier questions is, what were one of the hiccups? By and far, Colossians 2. Colossians chapter 2 was the sticking point for me. And that's the, the verse that I think is probably a sticking point Okay, so what what does people. it say, and why did it stick you? Well, the, the reason it it stuck me was that when you read verse eight, starting in verse eight, so Colossians two verse eight, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty seat, deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Messiah, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And I'm, I, by the way, I'm reading from the, the ESV for okay. people that are curious. Mm-hmm. It's just the translation that popped up in, in Logos for me. So I, I'm not an ESV or anything like that. I just do the responsible seminarian thing and have multiple translations going. <laughs> so verse nine, for in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. So if you keep going down the, the kicker, really starts in verse 14. So you, you read in everything to get context. Verse 14, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. In some translations that's not translated correctly, it'll say canceling, well, it's not even it's translated wrong, but it, it you're led to believe that this cancellation of the record of debt is the law itself. So that was a hang up. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And I don't know about you, but if I had a nickel for every time when I was growing up, that the law was nailed to the cross, is is what you're, what I was told. And I, I can't speak for everybody else, but you're told, well, the law is nailed to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, verse fifteen, and put them to open shame. So here here's the the second kicker, verse sixteen. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These things are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Messiah. And in other translations, if you take a look real quick, does it say only a shadow? Put the, does it insert the word only? Oh, let's take a look here. Which wouldn't be in in Greek, but uh, well, so the uh, New American Standard uh, it translates it, and it, they, to their credit, they put it in italics, so they're not saying this is in the passage. Yeah, but I'm gonna go uh, for me, but still, <laughs> but still, you right, were trying to put into your bias. Yes, okay. yes, there's a responsibility that the translators have to the people of God, and those italics, people don't read the the foreword that indicates this is not in the scripture, this is the writer or the translator attempting to help you understand. Correct. According to their opinion. Now, and in my opinion, the thing is, it is still technically true. It is only a shadow. Sure. So the ANASB says the these things are a mere shadow, not just only a shadow, a mere shadow. Okay, right. Of the things that are to come. So... There is a, I won't go so far as to say it's a denigration or a, de, a, a um, diminishment. Well, I would say it is a diminishment. I would not say it's denigrating. I don't think the, per, the, the translator is trying to denigrate what was given to the children of Israel. I do think they are diminishing mm, 
yeah. by using that word. And I can't speak to authorial intent. I don't know what was going through the translators' minds when they did that. For me, it goes, okay, did you think about what the consequences of your readers thinking pattern is going to be? And I would say there probably was consideration for that because you're trying to help the reader think the way or understand the way you think when it came to this verse, what you think is being said. May I uh, interject on that? Because I have talked with translators and these are good people. Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, there is no doubt that they are inserting bias in there. And when you try to explain why, at least for some translators, why that bias is going to have a uh, negative impact on the whole of Scripture, uh, that's where you get a disconnect because they don't understand, because they have their bias, they live in their bias, they don't right. understand how that is going to affect a reader negatively. And they do it innocently, but just... I had right. to throw that out there because um, it has been a frustration for me uh, with with uh, scholarly translators is they don't they're not aware of their own biases. Right. Well, it's so what. Oh, it, oh, exactly. It's it's, 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 it's right. So, it's so, it's so what, and so what's really important because you have a responsibility again to shepherd the flock of God. This is not a small task to do this. And again, these are not stupid people. These are brilliant people. They, they right. are. And I've got to interject this, is that uh, people don't understand that Bible translation is a missionary endeavor. It is. It is. It and, absolutely is. And you have a responsibility as a missionary to proclaim the correct gospel. Absolutely. And uh, people don't see Bible translation as that, and it is. Right. Because well, they they're, are, they're contextualizing the message of God mm -hmm. for an audience, and that's what missionaries right. do. Well, you you get down to it. The in your opening, you were talking about uh, Romans, and we'll we'll get to Romans at some point. Uh, yeah, we sure. probably need to stay focused on uh, Colossians <laughs> two here. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's the. Go, I'll continue out the NASB. Is uh, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking a stand on visions that he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. And it goes, Paul uses pretty harsh language here. He goes on to say, not holding past to the head. So this means you're separated from Messiah, which is not a good category to be in. So this is very strong language if you're doing whatever Paul says, and then it summarizes, goes down here to verse 20. If you've died with Messiah, Christ, to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees? That's a problem word. Because you you think in your head, decrees will, it's got to be the law, is, it, is the assumption. Mm, gotcha. And so you, and it's not... Um, it's just it's the it's what's loaded into you. It's you don't think twice about it. You just say a decrees. Okay, well, decrees a law. Okay, so this must be the law. It's a very basic assumption. There's nothing. It's a very very intelligent people can do that. It's not a like I don't know. It just I wouldn't make too much of it because that's how I how I've read it. It just you go you read decrees and you think okay, well, this is what was decreed in the past, such as do not handle, do not taste. Do not touch. Well, the the Torah is full of do this, don't do this. So again, it in a somebody who doesn't have a huge Old Testament background, right, is going to read into this and and not it's not a horrible logic leap to think, oh well, this is talking about the Old Testament laws. That that's not it's not an unreasonable conclusion. And then in parentheses here, it says, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with commandments and teachings of men. So that is where, well, 23, this again, Colossians 2 was a huge problem for me. So verse 23, wrapping up, these are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. I don't know if there was just a veil 
over my eyes that I didn't make the connection. But you're taking a look at this and you're going, oh, my gosh, well, it sounds like Paul's coming down pretty hard on the law. It, it just a first sure, read. Yeah. But when you go back over it, there is a couple of buzzwords that make you or should indicate that something that, that can't be correct. And the reason it can't be correct is because verse 23, he talks about self made religion what israel received at sinai is not self-made religion it wasn't like moses got up went up there got a chisel and just started writing stuff on tablets the truth claim that the bible makes is that it was god who gave these laws right. and these statutes. And so I had to reread this several times because of that little nuance. It's a, a massive issue because you're you, you, this whole time you're thinking, oh, well, this is the law. This is the law. This is the law. And then verse 8 was another hint. I was like, this can't be the law. Verse 8 says, See that to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men. So at this point, you're differentiating tradition of men from the instruction of God. And the reason I do that is because of Yeshua, because of Jesus, because what does Yeshua always get on the Pharisees for doing? Holding to traditions of men. Every time, Yeshua is always getting on the Pharisees, sometimes in love, sometimes in a little bit more, seems like tongue and cheek at points. He always gets, like the hand-washing situation in Mark 7. Right. That's the big one that well, I know we'll cover at some point. But Mark 7, this whole hand-washing uh, thing where um, it's a it, that's that's an example and you, yeshua gets into this it says you're you're doing this and this is a tradition right and so yeah we'll cover that but i mean we know that the thrust of the text is the hypocrisy uh of them following traditions of men not of god and Right. Unfortunately, uh, people think this is about a uh, a food law in that ver in those in that chapter, and it's not. No. So we will get to that. I need to know. We all need to know. What did you do with Colossians two? What were your What were your alternative conclusions? H how do you now understand it? Well, how I would now understand it is that what Paul is going against it appears to be the consistent issue of the early church having to battle against, and I use this term in a way that other people may not, but against the quote unquote Judaizers. This is a repudiation of traditions that had latched themselves on to the commandments of God, not things that originated from the Lord when he gave the law at Sinai. These are obviously foreign to that. And when I began to explore the cultural context, you realize that many of the things that the Pharisees did, for example, was they would put hedges around the law so as not to break the law. To their credit, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Right, But it becomes a bad thing looking at what Paul's saying here when it's a human argument that actually becomes detrimental to you abiding in Messiah and staying attached to the head. Paul says that these things can separate you. So for me, I look at this text now and I go, there's no way Paul can be talking about the law here. He's talking about human, self-made religion and tradition. And it, it says it in the text. It says uh, human traditions or man-made traditions and self-made religion. It, it, this is a, 
NAS, NASB translation, it says that. Right. This isn't hocus pocus in parentheses. Yeah, it's not like you trying to get some far out interpretation that isn't right, right in front of your face. It's it's right there according to the tradition of men, verse 8, and then verse 23, self-made religion. Okay, it's, so then start back up at the beginning if you can try to pick out those texts uh, with uh, what was nailed to the cross. What You read these things sure. now, what... What are the sh- what's the shadow? How do we understand these things? How would you now read the read the those problem verses? Yeah, so I when he says let no one judge you in regard to food or drink or in a respect or festival or new moon or a Sabbath day, this is verse 16. It would appear that what's going on is he's speaking to believers who are doing these things but they're not doing them according to the way that the traditions of the time had prescribed that they do them so there was a niche there was a extra that had been imposed upon these things and so what paul is saying here is look these things are a shadow the substance is Messiah. Don't let anybody judge you when it comes to these things. Because, the repu- again, the repudiation, the rebuke comes against the human tradition. So it's like, don't, don't let anybody judge you how you're doing these things. If you're doing them according to the good doctrine that you receive from us and what's in the Word. Don't let anybody spin this and say, well, you have to eat the bread and drink the wine in this certain way, or you have to fast in a certain way certain times during the week, or add extra caveats to the Sabbath, like, for example, what the Pharisees did when Yeshua and his disciples are passing through the grain field, and they say, your, your, your disciples are doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath. And Yeshua rebukes them and says, have you not heard? And he goes into the whole diatribe, the whole little anecdote with David. Right. And he rebukes them. So it's not the picking of the kernel if you're walking. It would have been the making of bread. And so there's no violation of Torah. So when I look at this, I go, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about the extra stuff, the leaven of the Pharisees that got in it's extra it's not god made it's human addition it's man made tradition it's self made religion and paul says so don't don't let somebody do that and it's interesting because he's actually quite generous and he says that these things have the appearance of like being good mm. and maybe they are not all bad so then what is being nailed to the cross? Let's just start there. What's being nailed to the cross? Well, it says flat out it's the record of debt. Which is different than the law? Well, does the law indict you? It does, does ind- law- it does indict you. It indicts you, but the it's not actually it doesn't start off with a a a, a it's a tabula rasa, it's a blank slate, right? You you do this, this is good, you do this, this is bad, right? So when you get to this record of debt, the connotation in the past is it's a list of the particular offenses you have done. Right. That debt, you know, because it's not like everybody's broken every single aspect of the law in the sense that, and I, I know people say, well, there's a passage where it says if you trespass against one law, it's a trespass against the whole law, you break the whole thing. I, I got that. But right, yeah. For the sake of the conversation, not everybody has physically murdered. Correct. Not everybody right. has committed physical adultery. Not everybody has built a wooden statue and bowed down to it. Yeah. But we... Right. But as you know, uh, when people are referring to you break one part of the law, you break the whole thing. They're just uh, saying you're in, you are um, if you break any of it at all, uh, you are uh, no longer perfectly holy. Yahweh demands perfection, hence the need for the cross, which is true. 
Yeah, and that's an absolute truism. For the sake of this conversation, that record of debt, it's it, it's the term, the, the legal term is this idea of you did this, this is now in the list of charges against you. Paul is saying, in my opinion, and I think the context bears it out, that that certificate of debt, what you owe, that gets nailed to the cross. It's not the law that gets nailed to the cross. It doesn't say it's the law. But when Paul wants to talk about the law, he says the law. So this right. is obviously not the law. This is obviously... I say obviously, I don't mean that in a condescending way, but it's it seems that Paul goes out of his way to make sure that the people that are looking at this would understand that this is not the law. In fact, the, the Greek uh, karographon is it's like a record of debts this is this is how it gets borne out in uh, three different lexicons you have strongs um and then the the low nida it's record of debt the the people who who do these don't even try to say it's the law they're they're very clear it's just it's it's a record of debt that's that's all it is it's not nomos which is which is law it's not nomos so you have to just look at this and go, okay, Paul's talking about a record of debt. He's not talking about the law. So if the record, if it is, we just take it at face value, it's that he canceled, he forgives us our trespasses. Well, oh, okay, let's back up and say he forgives us our trespasses by canceling the record of debt. Well, then, okay, there it is. Does your the translation you're looking at, does it say and the ordinances? Um, it says that stood against us with its legal oh, demands. God, right, and that would that would be a, for me a little more appropriate translation. So right. the way that I have understood it, uh, and I'm, I'm, I guess I'm summarizing you, is that uh, before you have met Messiah, the law utterly condemns you. That's what it does. It's designed to point out your transgression. And the thing about it is, once we uh, find uh, the one that can uh, take away that sin, remove that sin from us, Jesus on the cross, our Passover lamb, what he mm -hmm. does is he, by his blood, takes our sin, however you want to understand that even, but in this context, it's going to be the record of sin, the transgressions, yeah. and he takes all of your sin and nails that to the cross. He's not nailing his own instruction to the cross. He's not... He's not even, uh, and, he's, and to say it another way, he's not uh, nailing the law that helps you see your sin to the cross. Right. And so then what I would say is what happens is the relationship of a believer to the law changes post-salvation. Whereas before it condemns you, afterwards there is no longer any condemnation. That's Instead now it instructs you in righteousness. Yeah, absolutely. It becomes, uh, well, <laughs> so the one of the poorly translated situations is where it says the uh, the end of the law. Christ is the end of the law. Right. Um, that's not a good translation. It's the better idea conveyed in that is that Christ is the goal of the law. Right. And so that just one word a completely different connotation oh it does it, it radically changes things when you actually get into the greek and the hebrew because you can pay loose and fast with some words but there are serious repercussions for saying well i can make it say this but that's really not what it means so yeah it's the the law as Paul will say in other places, or in another place, is that the law is your tutor. It helps you. And Paul says in Romans, I wouldn't know what sin was except for the law. So I don't know if I'm missing the mark unless I've got the law. So logically, if you, if you completely get rid of the law, 
you no longer know what is good and what is evil. And that was like to land nicely and kind of like stick the landing. Right. That was the thing for me. If you in Colossians that helped me finally get over the hump is that you can't nail the law to the cross because there's how, how then will he judge the world in righteousness? It's just completely arbitrary. You don't know what offense you've done and God would not be able to prove what was right or wrong according to what set standard has been established. So it would made more sense that what Paul is talking about is the is the leaven of the the Pharisees, if you will. And a fair it's not just Pharisees. You know, everybody get puts the rap on the Pharisees. It's not just the Pharisees. I would dare say this is where the denominational conversation comes into play. Mm. It's anything that you add that's not in God's word that you hold as doctrine and then impose it, even if there are other verses and other things that the Lord has given that those things are in direct conflict with. The moment that happens, that's what Paul's talking about. He's talking about this the human elements that are brought in that conflict. If the human elements don't conflict, no problem. Paul's saying in Romans, you don't get to impose it on somebody else's conscience. Right. But if you're not violating the law, you're good. If you've got a certain way that you want to wash your hands before you do every single feast day, awesome. If that's a hedge of holiness for you, great. But you don't get to say, well, this makes me holier than you. You know, and I, if you, I, I want to say I really appreciate how you put that for everybody because I think that a lot of people fear that if they begin to follow the Torah, they're going to lose their cult, cultural heritage and the truth is, no. I mean, uh, we're, here's what we're not for. I'm not for over-contextualization in the sense that we out, go outside of what Yahweh has given us to do. And I always give the example of the Apostle Paul uh, contextualizing for the people in Athens. Hey, look at this uh, this little idol thing, unknown God. Let me declare to you. But then he doesn't. <laughs> after that, go and unbolt the thing from its uh, base and take it into the synagogue and continue to contextualize, right? I mean, there's a, there's a point right. at which he stops. Now, that said, is that I, I, I think that people fear that somehow, I used to say your background is Presbyterian, and you have a particular way, you know, you guys have a vibe in your congregations, okay? You dress a certain way, you comb your hair a certain way, you, you, you interact with elements a certain way. I mean, we get all that, but that's one of the beauties of what God has prescribed in the Torah, is do those things, but you can, uh, uh, don't obliterate it, but adapt it to your cultural context. And, right. you know, and I just like, man, I, I, people get so fearful. Now, are there things that you're going to have to let go to because those particular practices belong to a pagan god in some way? Yes. Yeah. And that, and, and that I, I'm not going to mince words on. There are things that people are yeah. going to have to let go. But, you know, yep. look, that's the thing. And, and, and I know that I'm, 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 I'm slamming a lot down already, but, uh, you know, we, when we invited... Uh, Jesus into our life, it's a complete wrong way to phrase that. Uh, right. we, we were invited by Yahweh, by Yeshua, into Yahweh's kingdom, into Yahweh's life. And, right. you know, there's some cultural things that we're going to have to cut ties with in order to be a part of a brand new narrative, a new kingdom, doing things Yahweh's way. It happened for the Israelites. And, of yeah. course, they innocently build a golden calf. They shouldn't do that. And, and, and they, but the thing is, they innocently did it. And Yahweh doesn't like that. And so there's going to be things that people yeah. have to let go. Now, in all right. that, here's what I like. Here's what I need, we need to do. Um, we're going to have many, many conversations like this. Yeah. But what I want to do is I want to uh, con continue right now in what are uh, – uh, any other additional comments you might make on Colossians two in your in your mm -hmm. progression, and then finally, uh, the idea of holiness, because I think that does work mm -hmm. into Colossians two a bit. In that, 
okay, the certificate of debt was nailed to the cross, but you are still held to a, a holiness standard. I mean, we're coming out of a, a, a narrative in the past, moving to a new one, but, and God doesn't want us to be holy. How, what's, your, what's your thoughts on all this? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I would say that I've probably exhausted the, the commentary on Colossians at this point, but what I would do then is I would I'll make a logic leap here. Okay. And I would say the logic leap is Peter and Paul were never in disagreement. Peter speaks highly of Paul at the end of his correspondence. Right. And he says people twist Paul's words. So I make this leap because of your question about the connection with holiness. So if you go go to First Peter, chapter one, and I'll pull it up here in my uh, my logos, First Peter one sixteen. Uh, actually, I'll start in thirteen for context. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ or Yeshua Hamashiach. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. You used that word earlier, mm, the right. golden calf. Do yeah. not be conformed to that. But as he who called you, to your point, you didn't invite Yeshua into your life. That's, that is not the way this works. If you re- read the re- end of Revelation. Now, this, to, for our listeners, I want you to know uh, Yeshua, Jesus, does come into our lives, but... It's a right. It's it's a paradigm right. <laughs> that uh, has given people uh, a way of thinking about uh, their relationship with God, like somehow God just is an addendum to what I already do. Right. So yeah, he to clarify to the listeners, yeah, because I do not want to come across. Yeah. The grass. When when you started having the dialogue with Messiah and received the grace and the mercy of God through the power of his son's cross, there was something going on there. And I do not want to minimize that. Yeah, Our language, our vernacular is not capturing that moment correctly. When we say we are inviting him. Perfect. That's just, that's not what's, it's not what's going on. Do not diminish that moment. That's, that's not a, a good description of what just of the transaction that just occurred because the end of revelation who says come the spirit and the bride they say come and then it says here in verse 15 of first peter chapter one but as he who called you oh so now you're called right you're being brought and it says as he who called you is holy you also be holy in all your conduct since it is written and the the quote here is uh, from Leviticus 11:44 you shall be holy for i am holy and this is where good and evil and holiness are completely tethered okay if you do what is holy you are doing what is good and if you're doing what is good you are doing what is holy and set apart Ah. If you do what is evil, you're no longer walking in holiness. And the only frame of reference that Peter would have had, that Paul would have had, and I will say by default we should have, the only frame of reference that we have for right and wrong, good and evil, and understanding what it means to be walking in holiness it's demonstrated in the New Testament, but the foundation of that and what that actually, Yeshua gives us what a functionally holy life looks like. The apostles give us, despite their shortcomings at certain points, right. gives us the, a, a pretty doggone good, functionally holy life. Their frame of reference for what was good and holy and pleasing is completely couched in the Torah. That's the only frame of reference they would have had for what was good and holy and righteous. 
and for what was bad, evil, what was clean and unclean. There's no other frame of reference for them. They weren't pulling from Babylon. They certainly weren't pulling from the Romans. They most definitely were not pulling from the Egyptians. Certainly not the Assyrians or the Philistines or anybody else. God held them according to the standard he had given them. So this connects with me for holiness because holiness is what the Lord wants of us. This is what his apostle Peter says. You should be holy in all your conduct. Okay, well, I believe that the Lord is a just judge. It says he's a just judge. Psalm 7 says he's a just judge. Is the king of king and lord of lords and the judge of all going to give me a situation that is untenable where I don't know what it, how to be holy? No, and his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Right, and by the way, that's also in the Torah. Moses, people say, well, I can't do all those 613 commandments. Moses says in Deuteronomy that these, this is not hard. It's not hard. What's hard, tying into Colossians chapter 2, right. is the man-made mucky muck. Yeah, for sure. That's when it gets hard. The commandments of the Lord are pure. Go, go talk. I wish I could have a conversation with the writer of Psalm 119. That dude can't get enough of the Lord's law. He loves that thing. James loves it too. James loves it so much that he says it's the law of freedom, the law of liberty, the perfect law. You're right. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, what, what's going on there? James says the law gives you freedom. Well, I thought that law thing was enslavement. And no, to, a, to the mind that is set on the spirit that has been liberated from the flesh that walks according to the spirit you look at that law and you go, oh my gosh, this is so wise. This is so good. This makes so much sense. It's just awesomeness. So, yeah, again, the, the tether there with holiness is I don't, God is not, and this was one of the biggest conflicts for me prior to realizing, oh, shoot, we're actually supposed to keep Torah, was I could never get a straight answer on what was sin. And you learn this in Torah, they'd move the boundary marker. And the scriptures say, don't do that. Right. Don't move the boundary marker. But I would find people would adjust the boundary marker based upon their own eternal reasoning. I did it. I would move the boundary marker based upon a situation to suit my needs so I could justify what I had just done. Well, and then last time I checked, um, I think everyone would agree with this, is that uh, we are to be wholly separate, just as our Heavenly Father is holy and separate. And because we've given back to Yahweh the right to determine what is good and evil, we have repented and we're now totally sold out to the idea that Yahweh knows what's best for our lives, to proliferate the kingdom, uh, you, you and me, part of um, uh, non-nominal Christianity, uh, we're all in. This is our life. So, hey, Jacob, uh, thank you so much for talking to me. We're going to have many, many more conversations. Hopefully, uh, uh, this will benefit um, people listening in. And by the way, um, if you are listening, just know that uh, I've got different conversation partners. They're all at different points of in the process, I guess. Um, some are... Uh, just brand new, discovering uh, that uh, the Torah is uh, important for Christian living. And in all this, you need to hear something from me and Jacob. Uh, the Torah is not the fourth person of the Trinity, if you want to think of it that way. <laughs> Our focus is Jesus. It, we want to be like Jesus. We are, we are saved by grace through faith. But we also know that we were predestined to walk in holiness, or as Paul says in Ephesians, to do good works, mitzvot. But it's it's like so much deeper. It's like a it's a it's an act of love on our part that it is a truly a law of liberty, a law of freedom a, a, that facilitates joy in a way for us to worship God in a way that exalts Jesus as King of Kings. And that's what we're all about. So 
anyway, um, we'll be back with you uh, next time, and uh, we'll just try to get these out as, as soon as we can. And uh, we have this evolution of uh, 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 everyday tour, and I just want to say thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.